Okay, I am uh, Robert Lawton, and uh, I came in as an engineer in 1951. Uh, probably a, a good place to uh, kick off is how a farm boy from Kansas uh, ends up at uh, RCA Corporation, mm -hmm. which at that time was Radio Corporation of America still. Uh, I grew up uh, on a farm in Kansas, of course, uh, kind of expecting to be a farmer. We all did. We all took vocational agriculture in high school. All four years of my high school were war years, 1941 to 1945. And I graduated uh, a little bit early. My, my birthday was in January. So I was 17 years old when I graduated from high school. And uh, so now the war was still on. Uh, the probability of a draft uh, was staring me in the face. Uh, and in August when the war was over, I was up in Nebraska cutting wheat. And uh, I came back and uh, I happened to be at a uh, small college in Kansas on a church retreat and uh, was offered a scholarship to start college. Uh, I had sort of thought about engineering, but not electronics by any means. And uh, so I went ahead and took the scholarship one semester, and the draft indeed was staring me in the face. A couple of us did not, you know, as farm boys, we didn't want to wallow in the mud in the Army, uh, so we joined the Navy. And uh, the war was over, but uh, so they shipped us to Guam, and all the CBs were coming back to uh, take care of the infrastructure that had been during the war. And so they pulled us out of the regular Navy, and I became a power lineman in the U.S. Navy. Rather unusual. But uh, a couple of us uh, did not want to spend time in the beer garden, which they had just opened up to, with the war open. We still had uh, many Japanese prisoners on the island, and the Marines were coming back from China through Guam. And so uh, I spent a lot of time in the library. And uh, in reading, uh, got intrigued by electronics. Uh, my father happened, though he farmed, uh, also was a licensed electrician, so I had a little bit of knowledge. That's how I ended up in the power lineman business. But it looked to me like uh, electronics was an intriguing place to go. So when I came back, I had one more semester of college and went to Kansas State and got a degree in electronic engineering. Well, upon graduation, there were several offers. I could have gone to Boeing locally. They had a plant in, in Wichita. Or Philco or RCA Corporation, or Radio Corporation of America, and I chose Radio Corporation. Well, uh, Arriving here is something of a shock for somebody from Kansas. I'd never been involved in manufacturing, industry of any kind. Uh, RCA, I think there were 350 some of us who arrived at RCA in 1951. Went on a rotation program, uh, scientific instruments, the uh, electron microscope was being worked on then, uh, pretty much fully developed, and I was working on some additional things that they were going to do, yes, detection. Uh, design of transformers, uh, I remember slaving in one building in 100 degree heat. There was no air conditioning in the, any of the engineering except for speaker design. <laughs> and uh, the radar operation for RCA was in 53 building out on River Road. Harry Weege was a Kansas State graduate, so 
he called me in and we discussed the campus and so on. And uh, another one at Harrison, the tube department. Uh, the fellow I roomed with up there uh, somehow got wind that solid state was really going to happen. Now, I had two senior papers. One was on transistors that I'd never seen. And uh, at the time of my rotation, I had still never seen one. They just weren't out yet. The other was on RCA's color television. But uh, so anyway, uh, I finished the Harrison rotation and was assigned to a, a facility that I had not had a rotation in, which was, I uh, don't remember what it was called at that time, uh, but it was uh, radio communications. They were doing the PRC series of military radio, backpack radios, and power amplifiers and what have you. And uh, the first job I worked on was a version of Loran for Navy ships. RCA had developed a uh, Loran for aircraft, and this was a der derivation of that and got involved in RF design. Uh, again, no exposure to any of this prior to coming to RCA and still something of a culture shock. Uh, then I worked on a, a vehicular power supply, you know, a 12 volt power supply for a Jeep. I guess they were six volt at that point, uh, which uh, used vibrators, mechanical transformations, and had a power amplifier so that you could put a speaker on these PRC backpacks. So you just plugged it in, it sat on the shelf of a Jeep. And uh, so that was uh, the second job I'd worked on. I guess I did all right with them because the next one was a shore end, which is sort of a portable version, a tactical version of Lorent. Mm -hmm. You could uh, set up the transmitters and what we were building was the transmitters. I was reporting to a gentleman by the name of Jay Ayers, who mentored many of us. Uh, and his background was high power amplifiers. And uh, so they, they apparently had some confidence in me because that was the first project that I did. I can remember that it was a successful one, but I can remember uh, we had waterproof cases that we put these transmitters in, and I remember being in the va thermal vacuum chamber and uh, the pressure release valve didn't, uh, didn't release, and so it was starting to blow up. Uh, you encounter those in engineering. <laughs> and uh, now, as, as a power amplifier operation, we got involved in something called tropospheric scatter. It is a beyond-the-horizon transmission method that uses uh, turbulence in the troposphere to reflect down some part of the power that you transmit up there. So for several years, uh, we were involved in, in tropospheric scatter programs. Uh, I wrote several articles for uh, RC engineering and what have you uh, on tropospheric scatter. And uh, so we installed those in uh, what was called the gap fillers in, in Labrador and across the top of, Can of uh, Canada to transmit signals between the various radar stations that we were, we were putting in up there. Uh, several of us made trips to uh, Labrador and Iceland. The big ones were in Iceland. I didn't make that one, but I did have Labrador. I recall we had service company people to do the civil engineering work uh, in siting these things. 
I remember being in the northernmost, it, it wasn't quite to Frobisher, but it was northern, northern Labrador. And the service company people had forgot to bring a prism because the Polaris is almost directly overhead and you couldn't, couldn't see through the telescope to, to spot uh, the North Star. So that got, got me involved in uh, the tropospheric scatter business. And uh, we eventually, not in my group, but uh, in other, another group, developed uh, TRC-97 series of equipments, which is a tactical uh, tropospheric scatter system. Uh, I have to refer to some of my notes on just when that was. Oh, that's okay. But uh, in, uh, you know, I, I got involved in, in the system analysis, of course, and that was the, the trip up there. Uh, but in, uh, in six years, I was uh, upgraded to a leader. And uh, the primary job that we had was with the Air Force as a subcontractor to an outfit called Page Communications Engineering in Washington, D.C. They had a subsidiary uh, that did design work but non manufacturing. And they had put together an ionospheric scatter system. Much bigger antennas, mm -hmm. huge antennas, mm -hmm. uh, several hundred feet high and wide. They were kind of a bed spring antenna system. And 60 kilowatts of VHF power to send uh, multiple telegraph signals across the Pacific. There was no cable across the Pacific. Right. Islands were too far apart for tropospheric scatter. So they contracted us to build all the equipment. And we were doing all the power and radio equipment in my group as a, as a leader. And uh, our subsidiary up in New York City at, uh, on Canal Street uh, was building the multiplex system, which takes multiple teletype inputs and places them on the radio system. So that was uh, my first almost management job, uh, but it was a huge job and we had our problems. The paid subsidiary Rickson uh, had built one of these things but had not put any drawings together on it. Mm -hmm. So they were drafting it as we were trying to build it. <laughs> so, but we, we did get that system in. And so that was my first management job. And uh, I'm not sure how good a job I did, but uh, at the end of that, uh, there was a program in Morristown. Well, no, there's... Uh, can I ask you a that, little question about your early period before sure. you became a leader? Were there some, was there a mentor or somebody who really directed you? Well, as I say, Jay Ayers was a mentor to many of us. Mm -hmm. uh, not a higher level manager, he was a leader. And uh, so yes, Jay Ayers was, uh, there, were, there were three of us particularly, one guy named Fred Cohen who established a company of his own. Uh, Weston Clements, who worked with me all those years as a system engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, we were mentored by Jay. And uh, within two years, uh, and the Peter Principal set in, I was a manager, <laughs> section manager. Now, our, our problem was that we had a job in production that wasn't ready for production. So it kind of established me as a troubleshooter, if you will, right. even though I was a manager. And uh, 
It took us uh, several years to get uh, that, those programs on track. The, the programs were called GKA-5, which was a UHF ground transmitter, and the TKA-2, which was another UHF system. And uh, we had to shut down production. So, you know, it, it's one of these things uh, that, uh, and uh, it's one of, one of our weaknesses. We, we might not have had good enough design reviews in those days mm -hmm. to really catch things before we went into manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We did square them away, and long about then, uh, we established a manufacturing facility in Cambridge, Ohio. Uh, actually thought about transferring out there, being a farm boy in Ohio, like a bit more rural, but uh, decided against it and uh, stayed with the job. Now, once we got that squared away, and we actually manufactured several hundred of these things, both in 54 building, which was again at River Road, but across the street from where radar was. And of course, by then, Morristown had been built, and they were building radar then in Morristown. Uh, I ended up in Morristown on a special assignment on what was called the, the, a, the AADS-70, the, the AD-70 which became the SAM-D program and the Patriot Missile program. Now, we lost that proposal and uh, we really didn't give it enough <coughs> communications flavor to win. Mm -hmm. Now we, uh, we also had Beach Aircraft as the, the missile supplier and uh, so uh, Raytheon won that job, but uh, that was a special assignment for me. And uh, when I came back, uh, I took a downgrade. We all have our ups and downs. Yeah. But uh, I got an increase in salary, <laughs> <laughs> which was puzzling to me. And I decided that perhaps I needed a different approach to my engineering management. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, had this job as an engineering leader and uh, I took the basic philosophy that I was the guy running it, not my boss. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, he and I did get into some, some uh, conflict along the way. Mm -hmm. But it was for a ground demodulation system for the video that was coming back from the lunar orbiter. We were just exploring the moon at that point. Uh, the satellite was orbiting and uh, sending a signal back. What I did do was do my own analyses and not just follow the specifications that came down from the prime contractor, which was Heightstown, and that plant had then been built. And they were basically my customer for this device, and discovered that the signal to noise ratio that they were specifying was a full 10 to 1 off. It wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I immediately went to uh, my systems group, which was uh, and uh, they provided a guy to do to confirm my analysis and give me some input on what hardware changes had to be made yeah. and proceeded to make them. Well, uh, that didn't sit well with my manager again. <laughs> However, uh, in fact, uh, I had a meeting with the chief engineer along with him on that subject. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the Astro people, uh, I don't remember whether they were called Astro at that time, but they were our satellite people, uh, did agree with me and uh, all was well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did uh, build 
about 20 of those things. I still have someplace in my possession a copy of the lunar surface that was sent back through those systems. Uh, so, that, uh, well, along about that same time, we were doing uh, some Minuteman work. And uh, at the end of that point, a fellow named Gene Kalkman was a section manager and was trying to talk me into getting back into the section manager. Mm-hmm. Hadn't, hadn't done too well before. <laughs> and uh, after uh, several weeks of uh, expressing my reluctance, uh, I did take him on again <laughs> as a section manager. Now, what I picked up as, as a section manager was uh, something called a microwave and missile control systems engineering activity. Now, they had a microwave system called the GRC-50. I had not been involved in the design, but I, they were responsible for following all the manufacturing and so on. And uh, also uh, some uh, other microwave equipment. And we on on uh, IR&D program, we're building a frequency division multiple, uh, a tri- frequency division multiplexer. Now that takes voice signals and combines them as analog into a single uh, stream that can be modulated on the radios. Now it, it never you know, we, we achieved all of our objectives, but we were transitioning into digital. So we were too late with the product. Another, another failure, uh, I won't attribute it to me, but, uh, you know, our, our section manager uh, seemed to, to think it was still good. Uh, and at that point, the Track 97, which is the Tropo Scatter unit that was developed by another group, uh, Walter Connor ran that group and did, did the original designs, was in production. And so we followed that production plus the GRC 50 production. There were always things cropping up, and uh, everybody wanted an immediate fix. But in production, you have to worry about it. So timing was my thing. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me that I, I always got in after something had gone wrong. <laughs> and uh, so as a section manager, that, that did grow. And uh, Mr. Connor who was running the development, well, we actually won the small SHF satellite ground terminal development program for prototypes for all the tactical satellite ground terminals for all, all but the Navy. The Navy had their own, but the uh, Army Air Force, Marines used this, these tactical uh, satellite terminals. So uh, I got a different title. Uh, Connor's group w- was developing these. Uh, we were in some cost troubles, which very often happened. Mm-hmm. They were uh, they were uh, uh, incentive contracts of various kinds, but. Uh, generally cost-type cost contracts. Well, Waller and O.B. Cunningham, who was the section manager at the time, had gone to the Army, who were, are de- were developing this, and uh, said, we will take it fixed price. 
just to settle out our cost problems. Well, that's when Frank Bailey and I were assigned to this because Walt Connor left and went to Raytheon. Uh, became a you know, fairly high-level manager at Raytheon. But we were faced with completing this program. Again, part of my reputation for getting in to, uh, to, the <laughs> to problems. And uh, so we did complete those not without difficulty. Uh, it was... We then did the proposal to produce, you know, to design final product. Those were all prototype products. And there were a number of them. There was a Jeep mounted. There was a small truck mounted. There was a large truck mounted. Uh, there was an aircraft one. There was a backpack that you could pack in. And uh, so we, we did finally complete those, not without problems. Now, th that work was being done on Route 130 in a separate leased building. Uh, so uh, we, we did win that production proposal. So I had a pretty good grounding in the satellite ground terminal area. And uh, so I was involved with a pretty good uh, size group in uh, designing the small SHF satellite terminals, uh, hundreds of them which, which have been built now. And uh, went through all the qualification testing. Uh, we did a satellite test. I, I'm not a satellite, a uh, helicopter lift test on one of our terminals. And the guys somehow mixed up the, the harness that we used to lift and we dropped one from about 50 or 60 feet. <laughs> so, so engineering does have its problems. I can remember going through the insurance uh, aspects of that. But everything survived except the, the carriage, the wheels and, and trailer that the, the thing was on. And uh, we did produce a number of those. Uh, and uh, so uh, now let's see. Uh, we also did uh, well. We we bid on a number of things. Uh, the, terminals for the White House, which I don't think we won, and we did a lot of advanced work. Now, at, at, uh, in about uh, 72, uh, I got redesignated from just the satellite area to a broader radio frequency area that we chose to call uh, equi uh, Transmission Equipment Engineering. And there, we picked up the follow of a number of programs, uh, including the uh, the IR squared program. We were supporting uh, integrated radio room for the Polaris submarines. Now, uh, that was people from my group. I, I did not supervise any of that work per, ta per se, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they were part of a huge team, and I'm sure some of the, the other interviewees will have uh, descriptions of the integrated radio room and, and taking existing equipment, supplying new equipment where necessary to integrate this complete submarine communications room. Now, did you like doing that 
higher level supervising, or do you like being on the ground and getting your hands dirty? I, I'm a hands-off type. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we had uh, you know, a number of those things. Uh, so I had the entire RF group in surface communications. There was a separate airborne operation. And along about that time, the chief engineer, who I think was Don Parker at that point, uh, concluded we would combine those two operations. Now, the, the leader of the aviation group uh, was a specialist in, uh, in optical disc recording, and about that time RCA got involved out in Indianapolis in the video discs. Mm -hmm. So he chose to go with that operation to Indianapolis. And uh, the chief engineer in his wisdom uh, provided, you know, put all of that under my purveyance. Mm -hmm. uh, which involved uh, P3C radio rooms, which had been developed previously, but which was in, still in production, and created its series of problems. And uh, a, a number of other programs uh, that uh, were in the radio area. So I ended up with, as, as manager of all of the radio frequency group in Camden. Uh, we were doing work at, at low frequency, which uh, what was it called? I, I don't recall what it was called, but it, it was a huge uh, emergency communications operation that we were supporting. HF, we were doing advanced work in HF, and a consultant had been brought in, Dr. Rohde. Uh, he was a son of the, the uh, founder of uh, Rohde and Schwartz over in Germany. He was brought in to uh, develop the HF business. Again, uh, I entered some, some counter viewpoints on whether HF was a viable communications medium at that point in time. Uh, we also had a program come in for uh, uh, intelligence work for the, for is, the Israelis. Uh, I have a, a mental blank on what it was called. But uh, anyway, we again had some differences in opinion on whether we should be attacking that program. Now, they, they did indeed do that. But in the process, uh, I was uh, again relieved of my duties and put on the chief engineer staff as uh, design assurance, which was appeared to be my forte anyway, was troubleshooting uh, mm -hmm. programs that had problems. Uh, I spent uh, oh, several years in that job. And uh, I got, uh, I was contacted by Charlie Schmidt, who was then running the Astro Division, which is the Satellite Space Division of RCA, regarding a program called the Advanced Communications Technology Satellite Program. It was a NASA prerogative. Uh, again, with some dissension at the top of NASA, uh, mainly because it was intended to develop a new frequency band for commercial communications and was not, uh, it was the people who ran NASA at that time were more interested in the moon and Mars and, and getting to Mars primarily. Uh, before we were done with that program, uh, Dan Golden from uh, TRW took over NASA, and he definitely wanted everything going to Mars. So that's where we stand it today. It took a lot 
with the government? Yeah. Did you? How was that relationship? Uh, actually, with with the people who count, we were the people at uh, Lewis Research Center, which is now Glenn Research Office in Cleveland, was excellent. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, so uh, anyway, Charlie Schmidt uh, contacted me and said we have this program. It's been kicking around now for a couple of years in Congress. Congress wants it. NASA leadership does not. NASA is still working on it at Lewis. And uh, it looks like it's going to fly. Congress is going to pass this. And uh, he said, I, the guy that I've designated as manager is going to take over uh, the Earth Resources Operation, uh, which has just been spun off. It was, it was a, a quasi-government for a while. And anyway, he was taking that over and he wanted a program manager. So I ended up, well, uh, I should say I, it took me about four months, but uh, again, the Camden general manager would not, not let me depart until we we solved another production problem, <laughs> which was uh, phase noise in, in our small satellite terminals. And uh, so I reverted to engineering at that point, and between Don Bassard and I, we discovered that a change had been made in a very critical part of the small terminal, which was the uh, controlled crystal oscillator that controls all the frequencies in the system. Someone had changed a steel case to a brass case and we had magnetic coupling into it. So having solved that problem I was finally allowed to go take over the AXE program. And uh, it too was one of these programs that has, uh, so we spent a lot of time with money, and a lot of time with technical requirements, and it was a turnkey program with both the space and ground segments and all the software uh, being, you know, uh, all, all one big contract. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I ended up at Astro for the last five years of my, uh, my tenure at RCA. And uh, I re retired a, a bit early, I was 61, mm -hmm. before that program was complete. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, had, I had handled it from, uh, for the first five years and uh, managed to now, it turned out to be a very successful program, and uh, we opened up what is now called the KA band program, the KA band frequency spectrum, uh, with with that program. Uh, I could go into far more detail on the satellite, but I don't think that's appropriate for just just creating history. Yeah. So that's my history with RCA. Uh, some of the things I worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, what were your I, co oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask you about your co-workers. What were they like? Uh, most of them, well, let's, let's say nearly all of them, were great. They, they're knowledgeable people. Uh, now, during my tenure, I think the company, company changed character. You know, this has a little less to do with personnel than it does just company character. Uh, but after I once got uh, into what industry is about, uh, RCA, uh, we used to think it to be... Uh, that, that, uh, 
the RCA family was kind of hokey. Mm-hmm. But I think in those, those earlier days, the first 20 years or so, uh, it truly was that. Uh, I was involved, there, there was an athletic association. Mm-hmm. We paid dues into it. We had basketball, which was my big thing. We had softball. We had a, a skiing a club. And uh, so it was very much a family. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was, uh, when I was a leader, er, early in my tenure as a leader, uh, there's a magazine called RCA Family something. Yeah. RCA Family something. Yeah. Anyway, there's an article on me as a leader. And showed pictures of me doing my work and meeting people, and boarding an airplane, and all that, <laughs> that sort of thing. And so it it was kind of family. Yeah. And what changed? Uh, I think we tried to spread ourselves too thin. Uh, I think when Bobby Sarnoff came in and we became a conglomerate. Uh, then secondarily, after that, uh, we didn't quite track the digital world <laughs> <coughs> quickly enough. Uh, we tried to go into computers and compete with IBM. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just didn't have the stick to it to do that, nor do I think we had the advanced development that we needed. Uh, I thought that the RCA Labs was a great, great incubator, and I think history has shown that to be the case, right right up through color television. Uh, But at some point, we kind of lost to the digital world, Mm -hmm. and uh, we just didn't capitalize at that point. Now, from a personnel standpoint, Certainly, all our relationships were much closer than what we see in industry now, mm-hmm. at least at the time I left, which is some years ago already. But uh, uh, generally, very, very knowledgeable people. Mm-hmm. We had a solid systems group in the Camden facility. Uh, everyone I encountered at Astro uh, truly knew what, what was going on and how to keep things moving. Yeah. Great. So um, I, I just can't imagine anything more dynamic than what I encountered. And uh, I think as RCA Corporation, we were a very dynamic corporation most of my tenure there. Did they recognize you well for the work you did? I always thought so. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as as individual relationships, you know, I don't know how many people had the same mm-hmm. uh, ups and downs that I did. Right. But as I, I said earlier, I came to a, a little different philosophy partway through and said, I'm running. Now, I have to sell what, what I want to do to my boss. Mm-hmm. Uh, if he wants to override it, I've still got to do it, or I've got to leave. That it was a philosophy that, that developed part way through. Mm-hmm. You know, those initial few years, uh, I was trying to do what what I was instructed. Right. Not good for an engineer, <laughs> and not good for a manager either. As a manager, did you enjoy hiring new people? Uh, hiring was not too much of a problem. Yeah. Uh, layoffs were always a problem. Layoffs are difficult. Uh, it requires ranking people, and nobody likes to rank people. Right. Uh, it also requires evaluating need, and you might make a decision on need rather than skill. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it, it's difficult to lay off people. Yeah. Not not hard to hire. Uh, There were periods when it was difficult to hire. Uh, I think most of that was uh, 
was an, an a, a salary sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, in general, Oops. pretty good. What was the best thing about working at RCA? Best thing of working at RCA? Uh, huh. I suppose uh, the personnel I was with, mm -hmm. again, skill level, uh, uh, partial family atmosphere, I think that's the best part of working there rather than someplace else. At various times I would take a look elsewhere and I didn't find an environment that I liked better. Okay. What was the worst thing about working at RCA? Hmm. I suppose that it was uh, the failure to maintain RCA. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, I believe the man's name was Friedrich, was talking to Charlie Schmidt in a meeting at Astro. I remember Charlie coming out of the meeting and saying, they've killed our dog. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, I think the worst part was the loss of RCA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, everything else was... Uh, Pretty enjoyable along the way. Now, did the RCA family, I've heard stories that RCA family included building families that men and women met and, at RCA and became... Oh, I suppose that is true. There's a lot of courting going on. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't true in my case, but... Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, yes. Uh, I know a number of couples who met, met at RCA. And fun uh, celebrations? Fun celebrations at Christmas and things, or did you participate in that kind of social Oh, yeah. Life? Yes. We always had section parties. Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember section parties out at uh, Medford Lakes. Mm -hmm. I forget the name of the place out there. Yeah. And uh, so uh, early days, even, even uh, in more recent, near my retirement, we would hold section parties at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and retirement parties were, were quite elaborate. Yeah. So you must, you must have moved into South Jersey in the early 50s. It was very different, wasn't it? Yes. And how, yeah. how do you think the impact that RCA had on that change? Uh, I don't believe that RCA either contributed or diminished the change. Now, I don't know what to attribute that yeah. change to, but I lived, for the first few years, I lived in East Camden, just off Federal Street at 26th, mm -hmm. in an apartment over the Antrim hardware store. Mm -hmm. And I thought nothing of living there. For a nickel, I could catch the bus and come right into Federal Street right. and walk off and right in the front door of one building where I was working at the time. Yeah. So uh, now I, I don't see how either the demise of, of RCA or any buildup of RCA would have changed what's happened to Camden. When you lived with your family, were there a lot of other RCA employees living nearby you? Uh, well, you know, I, I moved from there to uh, Gloucester Township. Uh, there were a few there. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved after that to Cherry Hill. There were lots of them there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, not close, no. Yeah. Right. Um, so how would you sum up your time at RCA? Uh, great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were ups and downs, both from a management standpoint, from a corporate success standpoint, uh, but that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a, I would sum it up as, as a great experience 
And I've said many times, I can't think of anything more dynamic than the electronics business from 1951 until 1989. Well, I, I didn't leave it until 2003 or 2004 mm -hmm. when I quit consulting. Right. So I, I just can't imagine anything more uh, dynamic or rewarding than what we went through.